Last evening, I began by talking uh, a little bit about uh, the state of the world, what we've seen uh, just in the few years of this new millennium, this new century. Uh, and an awful lot of it isn't good. You know, you look around and it's quite a spectacle, really. Uh, very sad, uh, frightening. Matter of fact, um, there is such a high level of general anxiety, I believe, in, in our country, in the world. Um, very little security. Um, I'm almost 60 years old now, and I can think back to when I was a boy in the 1950s, and there was security back then. There really was quite a bit of security. Uh, this was in the, of course, the post-World War II era. Eisenhower was president, and television had just come in for the most part. Um, I remember my grandparents had the first TV in our family, and the whole family would go to my grandparents' home uh, to watch television. Not every day, you know, maybe one day a week. Uh, Saturday evening or maybe Sunday um, and um, Sunday evening of course now this is national television in the 1950s um, Sunday evening Archbishop Fulton Sheen was on network television uh, that's one of the ways you can get a little bit of perspective is um, pan back uh, say half a century to when I was a boy and what television was like. Very wholesome. There wasn't anything, um, no, no, no sex, drugs, and rock and roll. No horrible violence. It was pretty wholesome stuff. Uh, there wasn't anything on that you would be afraid to allow your children to watch, for instance. They didn't allow it. Were we less free in 1954? than we are today? No, oh, I think not. We, we were free back then. It was a free country. Um, uh, some things have happened over the years that are a testimony to intellectual and moral debilitation. Uh, people seem to have lost their ability to think straight in many ways. We had freedom in the 1950s. We were a free country by all means. Uh, w what happened was we confused freedom and license. There's a difference between freedom and license. But, but the average person doesn't catch it. They just don't think very deeply. Uh, freedom is not being able to do whatever you want to do. I've said that a zillion times uh, since I began preaching. Freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want to do. You see, that's the underlying fallacious presupposition today in many of the discussions on freedom. If freedom is being able to do anything you want to do, if I don't like your face, I'll shoot you. Hey, it's a free country. And you say, nonsense. You can't do that. Or if I, I go out in the parking lot um, and I look for a... See, I'm a, I live in Montana, and we, we are truck people in Montana, you see. Four-wheel drive truck people in Montana. So I'll go out in the parking lot and look for the nicest four-wheel drive truck I can find, and since I like it, and it is a free country, I'll drive it home to Montana. <laughs> and you can walk home. It's a free country, right? Wrong. Nonsense, you say. Right. It is nonsense. You see, freedom is not being able to do whatever you want to do. That's license. Doing whatever you want to do, that's license. That's the abuse of freedom. And when you abuse freedom, Ultimately, you lose freedom. 
And so note the very important, essential difference between freedom and license. We see, as I said last evening, all the wars popping up. Now there's been war generation after generation after generation, just in my family's immediate uh, lifetime. You know, I told you my grandfather, World War I, my dad, World War II, some of his younger brothers, Korea, my generation, Vietnam, then the Gulf War, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, on and on and on, and all the threats of war and wars themselves. This is a dark specter that hangs over humanity. All of those wars, all that strife that you see, and it's hard to look at, isn't it, day after day? It wears you out. Uh, I have friends who are Lebanese, good friends, a family that Lebanese. I also have a very good friend. My college classmate was Jewish, and he's a very dear friend of mine. I got friends in Israel, and I've got friends in Lebanon. I've got friends in Iraq. I've got friends in Iran. I've got friends all over the world. And we look at this horrible panoply of violence and war and hatred, and it just wears you out. Where is it all coming from? How, should, how can we understand this? How can we get a handle on it? I'm going to try to deal with that in a spiritual way today. I'm going to do it in my own fashion. It's not rocket science. Uh, it, it's going to be simple. Um, I don't know how to do it any other way. I remember after I finished my final degree in my academic career, um, the director of my doctoral thesis in theology said to me, um, well, you have five degrees now. We've given you everything you can get. You've done well. You've studied hard. Now tell me, uh, at what level will you teach? Now, I had just graduated from a doctoral program in a pontifical university. And that was a rhetorical question on the part of the professor because, you see, we were all trained to be bishops, theologians, seminary professors, university professors. So that was a rhetorical question. He, he thought I was going to say, well, I'm going to be teaching at the seminary back home or whatever. He said, at what level will you teach? I didn't even think. It was instantaneous, kindergarten. <laughs> Kindergarten. I shall spend my life teaching kindergarten, the most elemental level. And, and I might add, probably the most important, right? It, it, it's the foundational level. It, it's where you get them w when they're most in that formative stage. They're malleable. You know, they're, they're open. You know how little children are. You can teach them so much at that at that age, you know. Later on, uh, for various reasons, they're not as open. They're, they're not as, as malleable, moldable, you know. You, they, they, it's tougher to get through. Kindergarten. And I've been teaching it ever since the first day that I began. Kindergarten. That's the elemental level. Most people in the Catholic Church have never gotten beyond kindergarten in their knowledge or practice of the faith. And I don't mean that as an insult. Please believe me. I have great respect uh, for all of our good people, especially the good folks that take their valuable time out to come to a conference like this. Uh, but I have proven time and time and time again that I'm right. I knew I was right when I began my first day of preaching. I'd known it for years. Now, I verified it for myself by giving a, a little exam. At the end of every mission that I would do when I first started out, first three years, I gave a 10-question quiz. Um, like this afternoon, for instance. I could hand out exam papers, have the ushers lock the doors. <laughs> 10 simple questions. Now, you, 
You know, I, I, one of the questions, or all ten of them, depending on how I want to give the exam, could be, what are the Ten Commandments? That's simple. Now, you have to admit, Ten Commandments is basic stuff. Now, that's basic, that's Christianity 101. You, you can't get beyond that. I mean, you have to admit, that's basic. But, I'll guarantee you, if I gave that exam, you find out that you're not as smart as you think you are, right? Because when I started, I asked myself the question. When I said, and you know what? I didn't get it all right. And I had a, a doctorate degree in theology. There's only one way to verify if education has been successful, and that's to test. Outcome-based, you know? Either you get it or you don't get it. You know, if I teach you a, a body of information, whether it's mathematics, English, French, history, catechism, whatever, you should be responsible at the end of the course for a certain amount of information. Now, the way they do it in in the church in the old days, and they still do it, where I went to school in Europe, the final exam, uh, they, they would condense the um, curriculum uh, for, say, a bachelor's degree student in theology. They'd condense that into 100 questions. And then on the appointed day, the examination day, which was a big deal, in front of the entire student body, you would go up, and it's a ceremonial thing. A man with a bag of wooden, though they were about the size of golf balls, numbered one to 100. And you reach into the bag, and you, you get your question number 42. And that corresponds to the question number 42 on the list of exam questions. Then you have five minutes to go out of the room, make some hurried notes, then you come in and give a 45-minute lecture on that. And then the professors, five of them, seated on a dais above you, have 45 minutes to cross-examine you. That's how you find out if you know anything. <laughs> and it's the only way, by the way, you know, you, listen. We have made huge mistakes in almost everything I can think of, certainly in education in recent generations. Uh, we, we had what I could call a case of temporary insanity in many cases, where, where we thought we didn't have to test, or, or we thought it didn't have to be outcome-based education or religious education. It has to be. There's no way around it. And if the kid don't get it, I'm holding the teacher responsible. You know, sure, uh, there are kids of varying intellectual abilities. Uh, some kids apply themselves, some kids don't. Um, a teacher's job is to take the subject matter and convey it. That's kind of like the function of transportation. You go from point A to point B. As a teacher, I have to know the subject matter. If I don't, I shouldn't be teaching. It reminds me of a story of my great-grandfather who was a master carpenter. And he had an apprentice carpenter. And the young man just didn't get it. He couldn't hammer a nail straight, couldn't make a straight cut in the board, and finally, after a year of exercising extreme patience with the kid, great-grandfather said to him, young man, either learn your profession or get another one. And I could say that to a lot of theologians, historians, politicians, whatever. Learn your trade, or get another one. If you're a teacher, you've got to know your subject matter. Uh, when I knew I would study for 
advanced degrees in theology, uh, I determined straight away that I was going to be the best I could be. I'd never be the best in the world, man. But I was going to apply myself 100%. And study day and night, year after year after year. And I don't, I, I don't have any great gifts uh, of the intellect. I do have a gift for philosophy and theology. I have a, an orientation towards I don't have any other gift that I can think of. I can't, I can't hammer a nail straight. You know, my great-grandfather would have fired me for sure. You know, I can't do most things. But the one thing God called me to, he gave me the gifts for. And that's the way it is with all of us. God calls you to something, he'll give you the gift. You just have to accept the gift and then apply yourself. The United States Army has a recruiting slogan, be all you can be. When I was with some senior officers in the Army not too long ago, I told them that they were guilty of plagiarism. They had stolen their, their they got their recruiting slogan from God. You see, Jesus said, you must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And be all you can be. As Christians, we should be the best, the very best, at whatever we do. If you're a physician, and a Christian physician, you ought to be the best there is. A lawyer, a teacher, a priest, mom, dad, butcher, baker, candlestick maker. Be the very best you can be. Excellence. There is no excuse for anything less than excellence. But I'm going to tell you something. You won't get it if you don't push for it. If you don't require it, you won't get it. You say, but some people are less gifted than others. That's right. I'm one of them. I understand that. You can still be all you can be. And that's a lot more than you might think. After all, you're created in the image and likeness of God. And so am I. And how great is that? That's pretty great. In order to understand what's going on today in the world, uh, you know the, what we might call a first derivative thinker, someone who looks at the surface, you know, they, they just look and they see, aha, war in Iraq, aha, war in Lebanon, aha, a war in Afghanistan. And then they, they, they just look at uh, the military component of that or the social component of that, uh, or maybe even angel enmities that came about for who knows what reason. They look at the surface. That's like in medical science. Let's say sometimes people may develop a topical lesion, skin lesion. They have cancer, a certain kind of cancer, melanoma, let's say, right? A skin cancer. Now, melanoma will kill you. One of my very best friends in the seminary died from it. You may look at that and you see this growth of this, this um, on the skin, a, a, a skin uh, lesion, and you say, ah, well, he has a problem with his skin, and so we should put a Band-Aid on that. Or we should, uh, you know, put some uh, antiseptic on that. And then it doesn't get better. It gets worse and worse and worse. Why? You haven't treated the underlying cause of the symptom. Treating symptoms isn't good enough. Treating effects will never solve the problem. You have to go to the order of causes. And so we look at all the violence in the world. Wars. The underlying cause can be traced back to individual human beings, always. It says the Holy Father, John Paul II, said all the divisions in the world, the, the countries fighting with countries, uh, countries fighting with each other. You know, look at our own country, the last presidential election and the one before that too. We could scarcely elect a president. So divided. 
was the contrary. Divided we fall, you see. Uh, why? All that division, division in families, isn't it interesting that, you know, that that, that split in, in, in the country, I'll, I'll just use it as an example. Now, I'm not a politician, thank God, <laughs> but uh, we'll use it because it's important. It's, it's something we, we somewhat understand. 50-50, uh, pretty much, right? Not much more than that, you know, a little bit more, but we couldn't elect a president last time around. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't conclude who won. And so there was, oh, bickering. And the country was polarized. Oh, if that guy gets in, I quit. I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> or Paris. Wherever. <laughs> As a side note, it'll tie in later, but a certain man of some stature and his wife, when that was going on, the wife is Mexican, uh, the, they went on a pilgrimage down to Mexico to a, a certain shrine of the Blessed Mother with, this, with, a, with an Arabic name, the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. The, you didn't know, you thought that was a Spanish word or Mexican word. No, that's, that's not. In, in its essence, that, that's, that's an Arabic word. Guadalupe. Guara, river. Lupe, wolf. The Wolf River. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that more this afternoon. Anyway, they went down there and prayed. Friend of the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. They prayed that our country might have a president. And that the one God wanted would get in. And I don't take sides. I don't campaign. I'm not Republican, Democrat, or whatever. I, I don't do that directly. <laughs> no, I can't. You're not supposed to. It's not my position to do that. But they went down, they prayed, and then, lo and behold, what happened? On December 12th, December 12th, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Supreme Court decided who the President of the United States would be. Coincidence? Strange times that we live in. In order to understand what's going on, you have to be able to go to the order of causes rather than merely effects. And that means you have to have a spiritual mind. You have to put on the mind of Christ. The worldly-minded person will never discern spiritual things. There is a war, all right. There is a war going on and has been going on for a very long time. St. Paul talked about it in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, when he said, Our battle is not against human forces. Our battle is against principalities and powers. Now note, those are the names of two of the nine choirs of angels. Principalities and powers. Fallen angels. That's what he's referring to. Now St. Paul, being a saint, and a great teacher, was going to the heart of the matter. St. Paul was not politically correct. <laughs> not in the world and not in the church. Our battle is not against human forces. Our battle is against fallen angels. The rulers of this present age of darkness. The spiritual host of wickedness in regions above. Therefore, he says, Put on the whole armor of God. And then he goes through what that armor is. Let me make a blunt, flagrant, in your face statement. Because that's what I like to do. <laughs> All this mess 
all of the war, all of the multiplying natural disasters, all of this hell on earth, all of the flames and the fury is not going to end. This thing in Lebanon, Israel, there will be no peace. Do not be deluded. There will be no peace. Not in Lebanon and not in Iraq, not in any place in that region of the world or any place else. There will be no peace out there. Until there is peace in here. There will be no security out there. Until the babe in the womb is secure, that their existence is not imperiled by a sick, degenerate society. That's why there's a mess out there. Do not think for a moment there will be peace. There will not be peace. I hope there is. I hope there is, and I pray there will be. I hope not one more human being has to suffer because of war in Iraq or Lebanon, Israel, Afghanistan, the United States. I hope not one more airplane will be destroyed in the sky or any place else. I pray for that. But in my heart, I know it's not going to stop. Why? That would be illogical, irrational that it would. We reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. And you cannot get around that. Since the turn of the century, since the advent of a new millennium, a quarter of a billion babes have been killed in what should have been the most secure place in the universe for them, their own mother's womb. And we wonder why there's no security. But you see, the purely rationalistic mind will never get that. They can't put two and two together. And that would certainly be a highly politically incorrect thing to say. Can you imagine if anyone today in authority would say something like that and make a connection between abortion or even pornography and the hell on earth? Why, he'd be considered out of his mind. Well, since they already think I'm out of my mind, I don't have any problem saying it. That's the way it is. I love my country. Love my country. But my country is on the road to destruction. And I can't sleep well at night because what is actually among the most heinous of crimes against humanity is taking place under the noble name of law. Horrible crime against humanity has been elevated to the noble status of law. Well, the Supreme Court says it's okay. It's okay to take the life of the innocent. The Nazi government said it was okay to annihilate all the Jewish people. Hitler said it was okay, so they did it. You know, at the Nuremberg war trials, they said we were only following orders. And at God's trial, at the end, when Jesus, the King, comes and all his angels with him and we stand before him, what will we say? I was only following the law. You know what they said at Nuremberg? Guilty as charged. And they hung him. The 
There's an attack in this real war. This war St. Paul talked about. The real war is spiritual. What we see are merely effects of the underlying spiritual combat that rages. When we do well in this spiritual warfare, the world does better. The symptoms of violence and hatred, war, they are abated. When we don't do well in this spiritual combat, the flames burst, threaten to consume the whole world. In any war, you have certain fronts, certain battles. In this real war, this underlying war, this spiritual combat, the two major fronts, two major battles, are the battle for the mind and the battle for the will. You see, this war is fought on the battleground of individual human persons. One person at a time, this war is fought and won or lost. The only definitive loss in a human life is the loss of eternal salvation. I'll say that again. The only definitive loss in a human life is the loss of eternal salvation. Nothing else matters. All else pales into utter insignificance when cast in the light of that absolute reality. Nothing else matters. You can make a zillion dollars. You can be king of the world and all it contains. If you lose your eternal salvation, you're really lost. There's no coming back from that. Very simple. At the end, when this battle's over, when the smoke settles, the dust of combat is blown away, and time gives way to eternity, you and I are going to be one of two things. One of only two things. We are going to be a winner or a loser. Heaven or hell. Period, exclamation point, you can't get around that. And the weak, debilitated humanity of today doesn't like that. The Western mind can't take that. We have difficulty with such a stark statement. Even in the church today, I could go to your average parish in the world and say that, and largely I would be rejected and persecuted for that. They can't handle that. That's too stark. Uh, that, that, I, I remember when I first began, years ago, when I began preaching, 15 years ago, I didn't preach any different than I do today. No different at all. The only difference was I was younger. <laughs> and, and I didn't have any standing you know nobody knew who I was I didn't I, I, millions of people hadn't seen me on television so you know you're a nobody pretty much then and you will be treated as such I remember I, I delivered a homily someplace and the pastor said you can't talk that way in the Catholic Church where do you think you are do you think you're a Baptist or something That's my patron saint, John the Baptist. <laughs> no, he said, you can't do that, you can't do that. That kind of talk is inflammatory. And, and I was still revved up with the Holy Spirit. And I said, oh, Monsignor, you better believe that kind of talk is inflammatory. Jesus said, I came to cast fire on the earth. And oh, how I long that it already be ignited. We need some fire. We need some fire in the church. That's one of the major things 
wrong. We seem to be just floating along in this spiritual stupor. You know, we're half dead. I know people that go to church every day in the Catholic Church, and they're decent people, but man, they're dead. I don't know what the, I don't know what's going on in their soul, but I'll tell you what, I, I, I look at the effects. There's a basic principle of spiritual discernment. By their fruits, you will know them. By their fruits, you will know them. I remember one time I, I saw two elderly ladies who came out of daily mass. I was with my mother, and this was very early in my reconversion to the faith. And these old gals were, they just come out of mass now, receive Holy Communion. They came out, they were fighting like cats on the front steps of the church. <laughs> Not physically, but, you know, yelling at each other verbally. I mean, abusive. Oh, they called each other every name in the book. They were about 80. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what on earth is this? You know, how can this be? How can you go to Mass, receive Jesus in communion, and come out and act like an animal? I mean, they were just tearing into each other. And, I, and I, that, I began to think about that and pray about that and meditate on that. And that, that, that helped me eventually in my study of theology and sacramental theology. You know, uh, we say in, in theology that the sacraments work in virtue of their own power. Ex opera operato, as we say in, in Latin. A uh, sacrament works in virtue of its own power doesn't depend on the holiness of the minister or, or the holiness of the recipient of the sacrament. The sacrament works in virtue of its own power. Ex opera operato. But the other part of the axiom, which they never remember, is obicem non ponentibus. Yeah, the sacram sacraments work in virtue of their own power if you do not posit an obstacle. And the obstacle is sin. If you are not well disposed, you receive little. You receive what you're disposed to receive. I remember I was trying to explain that somewhat profound theological principle to a group in Florida. And I used an analogy. There was people involved in agriculture in that area. And I said, well, it's kind of like this when you have to irrigate your farm. You know, you have dry land. And you've got to bring in water from, from another source, like you bring it in with pipes or an irrigation system. You know, if your irrigation ditches or your pipes get clogged up or the ditch collapses and the flow of water shut off, you know, the, the field doesn't get the water and nothing grows. It's just death. And I was making an analogy with grace and the soul, how grace flows through the soul. But if you're, if you're closed you know, through sin, if you're badly disposed, you, you choke off the flow of grace. And a man got it. It was like, you ever seen a cartoon when the light bulb goes on? <laughs> this, this, I, could, I could see the light bulb just go on. The guy jumped up out of his seat and he said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord for Father Karapi, the rotor rooter of my soul. <laughs> It is one of the more interesting compliments I've ever received. <laughs> indeed, indeed, the rotor rooter of his soul. Well, he got it. He was right. He was thinking correctly. You know, you, you get what you're ready to get. And, and this, this, is, this battle for the mind and the will, these are the two main fronts in the real war, the spiritual war. Um, we have enemies. Now, sure, our own fallen nature at times can be our own worst enemy, yes. Uh, sure. Now, we have the world. We have a world which is filled with sin, a, a world which has become perverse, uh, a world where all kinds of perverse and evil things are considered normal and legal. It doesn't make them right. It doesn't make them right. Um, you know, when people say to me, well, uh, what do you think? You know, abortion, for instance, or pornography, that's the law of the land. Uh, what does that tell you? Uh, it tells me that a majority of Supreme Court justices done lost their mind. That's what it tells me. That's the only thing that tells me. 
in plain English. That's that sick public policy, that sick law. That's not law at all. That undermines law. And that undermining of law ultimately leads for disrespect of the law. Uh, that's not law at all. St. Thomas Aquinas clearly taught that all law that's authentic uh, ultimately has to be rooted in the natural law which emanates from the divine law. Uh, and and uh, the way you can tell a lot of this is common sense. Common sense. You know, that our, our theology and philosophy in the, in the church uh, is very much taken from St. Thomas Aquinas. And one of the, yes, yeah, it's called Thomistic um, philosophy and theology, but it's also called common sense theology. It's rooted in reality. Rooted in reality. A good working def definition of insanity is to be out of touch with reality. That's a good working definition of insanity. You know, the guy thinks he's Napoleon. <laughs> you know, I'm Napoleon. You know, or I'm this, or I'm that. I, I, I think he's the king of Siam. He's this, he's that. Out of touch with reality. God revealed himself to Moses when he said, I am who I am. Remember that? Now, remember this. In antiquity, a name meant much more than it does today. In antiquity, a name represented the very being of the one who carried that name. Uh, for instance, a man who was uh, named Smith, he was a blacksmith. Came from a family of blacksmiths, you know. They, they, um, professions and, and, and such were, were handed down generationally. So, John Smith, well, you know, he came from the Smith family. Well, they were Smiths. Now, the classic and perfect example of this is Jesus. Jesus. The, the name means God saves. That's the perfect example of a name. You see that the name, God saves, um, perfectly represents the one who carries the name. So, in this battle, this real battle, the two main fronts in that war, the war against the mind, the war against the will. War against the mind concerns truth. God said, I am who I am. What, what does that mean? That is a profound philosophical and theological assertion, which we have intuited in the church to mean that God's very essence is to exist. God is, period. I am who I am. His essence is to exist. God is pure being. Everything else is what we might call contingent being. We're creatures, right? There's one creator, one creator, God. Everybody else, everything else is a creature. Part of God's creation. Okay. I am who am. Reality. God equals reality. To be out of touch of, with God is to be out of touch with reality. That's insanity. To be out of touch with God is to be out of touch with reality. That's insane. I submit to you we have an insane country and an insane world. Not everybody in it, but many people that are in this country are out of their mind. You know, the worse it gets, the more the ACLU and people like them clamor. Get rid of God. That'll solve all of our problems. If we just could get rid of God, get him out of the classroom, get God out of the public places, get God out of the consciousness, then we could truly be free then you will be truly dead, not truly free. No God, no life. To be out of touch with God is to be out of touch with reality. That is insane. And when you have an insane world, what do you have? Chaos. That's what we have, chaos. And it's going from bad 
to worse. The battle for the mind. Truth. The human mind is made for truth. And you may say, but what's truth? I, one of the most startling lines in all of the Gospels is when Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate. And you remember what Jesus said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate looked at him and said, truth? What does that mean? Pontius Pilate, that prototype of every schizophrenic politician who says, oh, I personally believe this, but my office requires me to do that. Split personalities. Their mama must be Sybil. I don't know, that, oh, my real self is this way and my political self is that way. Split personality, schizophrenic. White men speak with forked tongue <laughs> in plain English. And we wonder why we have problems. That's why we have problems. There's an attack on the mind. There's an attack on truth. Even on Jesus himself, who is the truth. The truth isn't something, you know. The truth is somebody. Jesus Christ is the truth. I am the way, the truth, the truth, and the life. Jesus equals the truth. God's is the truth. As St. Thomas said, all truth that truly is subsists in him who is the truth. God equals the truth. If you're out of touch with God, you're out of touch with the truth. Our mind is restless until it rests in the truth. God equals the truth. And so you evict God, you evict the truth. And then your mind cannot rest. You're in turmoil. And the world begins to decompose and self-destruct. And we wonder why. The attack on the mind, that's a major battlefront. That's why imparting, and I'm using this word on purpose. Teaching is a perfectly wonderful word and a perfectly wonderful reality. I'm all for it. But when, when you refer to the faith, I... I, I say we impart the faith. Now we teach the faith, that's true, but much deeper than teaching the faith, we impart the faith. Uh, I, I know of a case of a very great intellectual who studied for years trying to justify coming into the Catholic Church, and he couldn't do it. He, he tried, he couldn't come to it intellectually. Then one day he met Mother Teresa, and he spent about a half hour with her. Boom! That was it. He came into the church. He, he, didn't have, he didn't have to ask a question. He didn't have a question. You see? He, he was just flat convinced. Why? He'd come in direct contact with somebody who was convinced. And that was extremely convincing. And sometimes all the words in the universe don't suffice until... You come in contact with the word. And of course, that's Mother Teresa made Jesus present to this man. And um, he came into the Catholic Church. That, that's how it happens quite frequently. Now, there's an attack also on the will, not just an attack on the mind. You know, I've often said, this is one of my more, one of my more favorite sayings, that after 15 years of constant preaching, you know, certain things come out repetitively. Everybody has their little, little uh, things they get known for, you know. A lady made me a beautiful um, tapestry, uh, like, a, like a quilt, and, and it had all my little sayings on it. <laughs> and, and, and it was pretty, it was amazing, it's an amazing thing. I have often said that many of us know more than enough to be a canonized saint. 
Unfortunately, no saint was ever canonized for what he knows. <laughs> Saints don't get canonized for what they know. Saints get canonized for what they do, heroic virtue. In other words, knowledge isn't enough. Plato found that out in his Republic. Knowledge is important. The truth is very important. But once you have the truth, what do you do with it? And that involves the will. Most of us know right and wrong. You know, a large number of the people in this room were born Catholic, grew up Catholic, know right from wrong, even though you, you might not be able to, to get the exam correct this afternoon and give me the Ten Commandments <laughs> in order. You still basically know the gist of it. And um, you know right and wrong. That's not the problem. I mean, that is a problem. But that's not the hardest problem, I don't think. The hardest problem is the will. Once you know it, what do you do about it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm scared to death. I will never be able to plead ignorance before God. I will not be able to plead ignorance before God. Boy, I know it. I know what God wants. I know what, what the teaching of the church is. I don't have a problem with the truth, with the intellect. It's with the will. Knowing what I know... Do I always do what I should do? St. Paul had this problem. You know, he knew. He said, oh, I, I knew, but, but I found, find there's a war going on inside myself. Uh, often, I do what I know I shouldn't. You know, I, I know I should do certain things, but I don't. And there's the war that goes on. You know, you've got the intellect and the will. And that war rages within individual human beings. The outcome of that war inside determines what happens outside. The mess we see in the world, I can easily reason back to the cause and say, we're, we're, we're losing right now. We're losing this war. An awful lot of people are given over to evil. An awful lot of people in the world have lost, at least temporarily, this battle that goes in, on inside, you know, the, the, on the fronts of the intellect and the will. We're losing. A lot of people throw up their hands. They give up. Listen, I, 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 I've been, to this day I've been tempted to give up. To this day. That battle rages on. Now, God willing, I never will. First place, my father, who passed away in September of 2001, he'd kill me. <laughs> Surrender is not an option. <laughs> I can't give up, even if I wanted to. God, my dad come back and kick my butt. I don't have any doubt of that. Surrender is not an option. You got to hang in there. You got to fight the good fight. Now, this is a real battle. The intellect is under assault, and so is the will, one person at a time. If you can strengthen one human being, if you can convey the truth, whether through your words or your actions, or both, to one human being, strengthen their mind, clarify their mind. And their will, strengthen their will. You know, the will's made for the good. And that the will can't rest until it rests in the good. The mind can't rest till it rests in the truth. And the good and the true are names for God. As St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. Our mind is restless. Our heart is restless until it can rest in God. And so we want to evict God from society. And what we end up with is a restless, hopeless society. But it's not really hopeless. There's always hope. And so we have to be ambassadors for Christ. We have to bring light to the mind of humanity. We have to bring strength to the will. Show them what good is. Show them what the truth is. Do it. Fight the good fight.
run the race to the finish line, all the way to the finish line. And then, here before God and before you, I promise you, I promise, I'm putting myself on the hook here, I promise you, if you do that, when it comes to the end, and the end's coming fast, you know, don't, don't, don't be too worried about these things, you know, you, you see these cartoons and stuff, ooh, the, the end is coming, man, uh, the apocalypse. Don't worry too much about that. The angels don't even know when that's coming. And so we sure don't. And I don't worry about it. I don't care about the end of the world. What do I care about the end of the world? The end is near for me <laughs> and for you. Because you and I are not going to be around all that long. You know, a hundred years is the blink of an eye in the context of eternity. We're out of here. We're fast. And so fight that good fight. Run the race to the finish line. And then when it comes to the end of the line, you'll stand before Jesus. He'll smile at you. And you'll hear those beautiful words. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.